Hello ladies and gentlemen, Dustin Dolby here. Thank you so much for returning to my channel Workflow. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't because today I'm going to run you through a really beautiful system. I just bought this coffee machine. I love coffee and it came with a nice symmetrical lighting that's really common. People are always asking me how to light things for e-commerce, Amazon, Etsy and you know it's a popular request for a reason. You can always cut things out in Photoshop with clipping paths but it's always nice if you can solve the problem in an integral fashion in camera. So let me run you through my workflow for how to photograph products on a white background. And we're going to recreate the strip box lighting that's common not just in this brand or coffee machines but all over the internet you see this kind of thing. It's a good way to show the viewer something that's glossy with those nice highlights. And let me run you through a few kind of tricks and tips that I would employ to overcome obstacles associated with shooting a larger product on appliance. So it really comes down to getting a bright background and that's the frame we're going to begin with. So I have a single speed light back here in a softbox and it's shooting at a diffusion panel. I'll unpack that with some B-roll in a moment. But let me show you what I'm looking at because it's not perfect. We have our product on a very bright background. I have a histogram open so I can drag my mouse around and see up here we're 100% white. And down here we start dipping in the reflection to 80% white. And down here it gets kind of unacceptably dark. Though I will say, uh, we're within striking distance. And what I mean by that is once I bump up the whites in post, I'll be able to salvage most of this reflection. I just want a bit of reflection detail. And you know, you could tweak this more to have a brighter light cascading onto that reflection. One technique we're employing is called the angle of incidence. So why don't I unpack that a bit while I unpack this lighting. So I have a big diffusion disc here. And you get these off Amazon, super cheap. They're a really light solution. And it's a really good system because in conjunction with this big softbox, this Octabox, which is $39 if you can believe it, and I'll link that in the description, it gives you really dispersed, diffused light. And that just gives you, as I said, such a dispersed nature to how the background is, you're not getting hot spots. So you're just getting a really nice bright white background. That doesn't say it's without issue. So if we look at this, something that may have screamed out at you at the beginning is the top of this coffee machine is catching some light. That's certainly something I'll fix. <laughs> That's unacceptable to have that bleed into catalog white. And you see the product's catching a rim light. I actually kind of like the rim light, so I'm not going to move my product further away from the background. We could also use black cards, which are a common way to solve that problem. And do I got some clips lying around? Here's a clip. Like I have these clips, and I'll link these in the description as well. They're made by a company called Newer. And you know, I always shop around for clips online. There are so many cheap ones, it's kind of frustrating. But these are really nice heavy-duty clips. And the reason I want to bring them up is you could clip black cards to this diffusion material, black curtain, whatever, and that would help you cut down on that side spill we just saw there. But to be honest, I kind of like that side spill. It kind of augments our lighting setup into a four light setup uh, by doing that. And I enjoy the light there. It kind of adds another element of interest. So you don't necessarily have to have a completely silhouetted object to start with. You can allow the backlight to infiltrate your scene if you're comfortable with how it looks compositionally. I think that looks all right. Now I'm at ISO 400 just to keep my flash power low for a moment and you'll see random reflections showing up in the glasses here. Uh, that's not desirable but once I kill the ISO at the end and increase the flash power you know it'll be less ambient more artificial light and it'll look better. Another thing to point out is I'm getting a little optical phenomena here going on on the console and I really don't like that Let's solve that problem later because when we bring in more lights, it may block some of the insane nuked 100% white light and it might mitigate that issue. So we'll leave that till the end, not to procrastinate, but sometimes issues have a way of solving themselves. So why don't we bring in something to solve that issue we talked about here at the top because that was not looking good. So I will bring in a black card for this and I'm using a light stand, but like I said, you definitely could use kind of whatever. And what's the best way for me to do this? Maybe I'll just try clipping this like that. All right. And you know what? I just realized that's not going to work because I'm already at the max height on my light stand here. And you know, you don't got to use a light stand. You could use you could use a tripod from the second hand store. You could use whatever you want as long as it can hold something. And I'm just kind of guessing that angle. That looks a little too high. Eh? What I'm trying to do is just get it so that it's subtly floating above the object. And I'll trigger that from the computer here. And that's not good enough. So we see something happened. So let's just crank that concept to 11 here and try to lower that 
nice and low. And you know, in some of my previous episodes, you see me holding things often, hand holding lights, hand holding reflectors, but you definitely want to lock it down here, especially if you're shooting a ton of stuff. Lovely. Does that look a little funky to you? Looks almost like a little warpy or wavy or something like that. Why don't I try getting it nice and snug? I think it goes without saying that as long as our product is surrounded in white pixels, we can always apply an infinite amount of brightness to the edges. Like I can, I can select that and paste white and then that disappears. I can select the right over here and paste white and that disappears. So we're just trying to make sure that we have a perimeter of white. Okay, so the top is fixed and that's cool. Now something to keep in mind is we don't actually even have to leave the top completely black. We can introduce additional lighting into that. We can composite additional lighting. Or what we could do is use this exposure in conjunction with this exposure. And if we blend them together at a certain opacity, uh, since it's white and black, like literally, we'll basically be able to control what shade of gray the top turns into by adjusting opacities later in post, if that interests you. You know, this tutorial is definitely gonna lean a bit on the side of being long form and being very, you know, using tips and tricks to overcome using less expensive equipment. But that's not to say that at home you could kind of uh, expand this into a really integral setup where you have six lights at the same time and nothing's moving. If you guys know me, I have a three light setup. They're all speed lights. So I'm just gonna keep going down that avenue and seeing if that works well. So I wanna take one more exposure just so I can remember what the heck we're looking at. Okay, so what do we want to solve? Do we want to bring in black cards to the left and right to get rid of those rim lights? I certainly don't mind. Something else to point out is this exposure. Look at the reflection. Now look at that exposure. So our black card showed up in the reflection. So for my final version, I will actually remove the black card just so I can get a nice reflection uh, exposure to bring into post. And the post work isn't that heavy, guys, because you, you want to stay smart and know what you need to comp in post, but it's a very educated, calculated guess. It's not like, you know, fix it in post mentality. So I'm going to bring a strip light here and whatever. Let's just fire it off and see what it looks like. Sometimes that's a lot easier. Interesting. I got to say, I used to love watching product photography videos on YouTube and it's pretty magical just seeing lights turn on and stuff start to build. Can you start to see it? Can you kind of see the final product in here already just for me doing those two lights? Okay, so issues here are that's crossing the text there. And that's not good. But what I do like is over here, slightly to the left, you see the left portion of that coffee machine is also catching the strip box. I just kind of got lucky where I placed that, but I enjoy that. So let's just fix that text up and let's definitely straighten out that a little bit. So I'll tilt this a little more towards the back. And when I shot the test shots I did earlier for this, I must have tweaked this 400 times just to get it kind of sitting nice. And you know, we won't, we won't go crazy in this tutorial with the tweaking. We'll just, uh, we'll tweak it to a reasonable level. I feel like I've already illustrated like a, <laughs> a beef of the knowledge here, just having that white background in that strip box to see where this is going. Okay, so what do we think of that? We have a, space left for the title and that's important and we'll shine a nice bright light to make that look good and we have the strip the specular highlight sitting kind of in a nice location in between i think it looks pretty nice we can use an item like the console here to sort of gauge how symmetrical our lights are being placed like for instance you see it kind of crosses the corner barely there so i'll try to use that as a benchmark for my other shot so let's bring in a second strip box and you could composite this if you're going crazy and you just have one light. In theory, you could do this whole thing with one light. You could take your background exposure and then your strip box exposures and put your strip box exposures on lighten mode. That way the background will remain bright. But that's when it gets a little risky, if you ask me. That's even a little too frugal for us here at Workflow, I think. Wow. Strip boxes are really beautiful items. I just love watching how the light cascades over an item. Cool. So the right of the coffee machine is looking pretty nervous, which means we need to angle the light more towards the edge. If you look at both these lights, you'll see this one here, it's a little further away and it's not angled as much towards the back. So sometimes really micro adjustments are gonna make the difference there. 
And let's see what that does. Wow. That was kind of magical. Do you see this gold highlight down here? Excuse me for one moment. I have like a golden bench back there and I literally think the golden bench was just catching some light. It's weird, you really do want a black and white studio. Like even when I'm shooting stuff, I will wear gray or black. Okay, that looks a bit better, right? Eh? Yeah, I was catching that gold bench there. And that's looking nice. Now I should mention this coffee's been sitting in this pot all night. When I first poured it, I made the mistake of pouring it hot and there was bubbles all over in the glass here. Like this whole thing was all condensation and it was brutal, but I've sort of let it sit and now it's a lot glossier. And I think it pays off because when you look at those strip box reflections, they do look enjoyable. They don't look diffused and they look pretty direct. So where can we go from here? Let's zoom into the top there. Is it looking a little dusty? Perhaps, so this is an item I've bought recently. It's just a little dust blower and it's super useful because I just kind of get right in here. And man, I'll spend a lot of time doing this. You know, I used to clean things sort of haphazardly and then fix them in post-production. But I have to say, if I can inject 60 seconds into my shooting routine to blow the dust off and save, you know, an hour in post-production, that's a deal I'll take any day of the week. So let's zoom in. Yeah, we got rid of some dust there. And it's crazy, you know, dust really exists on a micro level and I gotta say it's pretty insane how sometimes it'll ruin your shoot. So I think this photo is looking pretty good. In terms of the consoles, maybe we could move the left light a bit more towards the middle. And perhaps that's getting a little too micro adjusty for a YouTube tutorial, but whatever. We're in no rush. Oh, that's not looking too good. Oh, I, I moved it the wrong way, guys. I'm human. Now, as it moved into the console, it also moved into the text there a little bit. So let me back that one up again. Now here I am micro tweaking it. I said I wasn't gonna do this. Okay, just, I'm sorry guys, one more micro tweak, will you let me? It's like, a, I need to breathe on it in that direction. Nice, now we have the text confidently swimming in a sea of dark pixel information, and that's important because since that black information will likely clip to black, once we brighten this text up, we can essentially straighten it and perfect it in post-production, which is, which is important. You know, you have to overcome a lot of problems, and one of them is you're probably not getting the label sent to you from the manufacturer. So if you look at this, this could be slightly crooked. You know, they could be actual manufacturing problems. You know, I've spent way too long in the beer store just like looking at a bottle of beer, making sure it's perfectly straight, and that applies to everything. There's little errors, and we can sort of augment that and fix it in post-production and kind of make it better than life. So there's a few things we're gonna fix here with a few nifty tricks, but let's check it out so far. If you shot an item that wasn't this exact item, you may be done at this point. Maybe the labels caught those strip boxes and look great. But my problems here are twofold. One, I want that text to stand out more. And twofold, the console is really dark. Do we wanna plug the console in? That's an option and you can talk to your client about that but I don't mind the look off here. I'm just, I'm just shooting this for fun to see if we can recreate this strobe style with speed lights. And I don't really care if that light's on. It won't make a big difference, but we should put, I think some more flattering light there. So what should we focus on first? How about this? I'm gonna take an ex one more exposure of this to make sure everything's straight. And then I'm going to remove the top flag so we get reflection information. And then I'll just grab a couple quick label shots and we'll throw this together and post in almost no time. So why don't we do it? So everything's nice and still. Now I should mention, I'm shooting manually by touching this. You're probably going to wanna to, in the real world use a trigger so that nothing shakes. My trigger is still in the mail from Amazon. So come on Amazon. There we go. So that's my base frame. Now guys, I'm gonna get rid of this as we discussed earlier. And each item's different that you shoot, but I hope as I shoot more items, you guys can just sort of absorb little tidbits of knowledge here and there. So this does two things. It gives me bright information. I can blend in at the top if I wanna make this blackness turn gray. And this frame also gives me more access to the reflection information. So those two frames I'll bring into post-production. Now, 
Let's light the labels. And this is where ideally you'd probably want a fourth light. But I'm just gonna actually take my light. Ooh, I'm gonna take my light here from the back. Strip box, and that's fine. Because we already have the perimeter of white captured. So now we can just focus on the label information and have a ton of fun. A little too much fun. Guys, I appreciate you've been leaving me uh, suggestions in the comments. And I also appreciate that you guys have been joining the Facebook group. Check out this photo. This is actually a photo I posted to the Facebook group. So that's what it's about, guys. On Facebook, we get together and we post our lighting setups and kind of discuss the parameters of how we built them as it relates to techniques on workflow and whatnot. And it's really fun. So if you want to learn these lighting setups that way, just join the group and you'll actually just get them in your feed. It's really convenient. So I'm going to put this at a fourth power. And this is a Rogue XL Flash Bender. It kind of just acts as a little... Uh, softbox because it's the XL Flashbender 2 with the softbox grid attachment. And this is just a really convenient way for me to inject label detail. It's really comfortable to hold. And the gridded nature does a lot in making sure the light doesn't spill in crazy areas. Okay, you guys have seen how I ran into that strip box on the way to turn the backlight off. Well, it actually ended up getting in the way. So I'm going to move that over. And in a commercial setting where I was actually shooting something like this, I would want to capture all these exposures in conjunction, not moving things around. It would happen in a matter of seconds and I'd premeditate what I'm gonna do. But look at that bright information. Now there's a huge sort of stain here where there was a sticker and that's no problem if you're comfortable in Photoshop because I'm not gonna bring that information. I just need the bright text from here to bring into that shot. And I'll run you through the whole post-production workflow, so stay tuned. Now the last thing is the label. Not the label, the console. We just did the label. The console's tricky. Look at it, it's down there. You have a shadow cascading from the middle of the coffee machine, the handle, and there's a few problems. It's a really tricky area. So let's bring in a really acute solution to specifically light that area. And for those of you who are operating on a shoestring budget, you're gonna love this. Because I have one of these, everyone has one of these laying around, one of these little diffusion discs. And I'm just gonna place it right here. And if you see from the camera's perspective, it's nice because I can kind of lower it exactly where I need it to go by using this little handle. This is just a tripod I got off like a secondhand store, literally for $5. So that just shows you how low budget these solutions can be. And let's just grab our grid and let's see if this is looking okay. We're a little too, little too low there, so I'll grab this and I'll crank it up a few notches. And I have to say, I actually enjoy the convenience <laughs> of that $5 tripod just for having that crank handle. Nice. Now I'm gonna to try to move it a little bit closer because it's at its maximum height and I want it to perspectively be a little bit higher up. There we go. And now the last thing we can do, because if you zoom in here, you'll see, you'll see that shadow is getting in the way from the handle. Well, let's just cheat reality and move that handle over. So now we're living in this perfect world where the handle doesn't cascade a shadow. And we'll get one integral frame to see if it's working. Lovely, so what I'm gonna do with this frame eventually is I will blend this, probably with a radial gradient mask, into the console area just to pepper a bit of light in there and show you that, hey, the console's here and we took the time to cascade a really pleasant light over it because we care a lot about our product photography. So at this point, with the remote, because I don't wanna shake the camera, I would just go crazy. Literally, I would have fun with this and I'll try different angles. Just go absolutely buck wild. Let's test how fast this can actually shoot off here. Ladies and gentlemen, the Young Nuo 560. I really enjoy it. This is the 560 Mark III. I also use the Mark IVs. And they're pretty good if you're not using one over one power all day, every day. So look at that, you have so many options. It's outrageous, right? So we'll grab this frame. We'll grab that frame. And how about, actually, I kind of like this one. It's soft and subtle, and there's something sophisticated about that. Let's run into post-production, and I'll run you through how we throw those together relatively quickly for a great final result. I'll meet you there. Bonjour, my friends. Welcome to the post-production element of this catalog white workflow. Consider taking a quick second to thumb up the video. It really does help out our YouTube channel. And subscribe if you haven't already. In fact, you can hit that little bell notification if you're feeling crazy. Now, we imported our files into Photoshop, and they're raw files, so we get presented with this dialog box, which is just so darn powerful if you understand these options over here. Let's hold Alt and click this node, and it'll reveal to us the 100% catalog white pixels. 
As we drag that node up, you'll see more and more of the background become enveloped. And what a beautiful tool. I'm so appreciative of that. I know 83 is the magic number to get this done for our particular item, but that'll be completely subjective. So don't copy my 83, put your own number in there, set it yourself. But now we know the item is surrounded in white pixels other than a little stubborn area on the reflection, and that's awesome. Now we can sharpen, we can add clarify, we can enable profile corrections, and we have a whole raft of subjective editing options. But setting the white point is an objective thing I always do for catalog white photography, and I make sure to do it within the raw console. So let's grab this frame, hold shift, and we're actually gonna synchronize it with the frame below, just for a consistent white point in that reflection frame. And you know, hopefully you don't have a reflection frame. Ideally you shoot this in one image and kudos to you if you did it. In fact, I would love to see your works. You know, email it to me or put it in our Facebook group. The link's in the pinned comment. I'd really love to see it. But for those of you who maybe you didn't have enough lights or you just did a tricky workaround like we did here to light something interestingly, let me show you a few tricks I would use. So for instance, the labels were dull here. So we captured this sneaky frame and I'm gonna kill the shadows on it. And I'm gonna hold the black point and actually bring it all the way down to the point where it's completely clipping. And what that did is surround the title in you know dark information. So it's subject to being placed on lighten mode and improving this frame like a light switch. It'll just turn the label on. And that's such a beautiful solution. And you know, I'm full of quick little solutions to take your shot to the next level. So why don't I unpack a few of those solutions right here. So here's our four frames. We'll start with the base frame. I think it looks elegant and sophisticated, but the reflection is destroyed. Now we have this frame, which looks like garbage, but we have a reflection present in it. So why don't we do some trickery here? Let's give it a mask by clicking this button. We'll invert the mask to make it black. We'll hit G to bring up our gradient tool. We'll select white as our foreground color. We'll select a foreground, a transparent gradient in a linear shape. And I'll just click right above where the reflection was ruined. And I'll go in a straight line and just cut it off right before that organic shadow. And what that did is just peppered in that reflection information. And I'm assuming you guys know how masks work. So give that a Google if you don't know how masks work. But that's a really easy solution to bring just that element in without taking all the you know bad elements of that shot. And that's nice. Maybe we have a little color discrepancy here. It almost looks you know a tad bit red or something like that. Let's see how good my eyes are. Well, it's more of a it's more of a fuchsia. But yeah, it looks like there's a little color cast in there, but it won't really matter because everything will be relatively monochromatic by the time we're finished. So like I said, we know the product's surrounded in white, but we know the reflection's being a little bit stubborn. Let me show you a kind of sloppy way you could approach fixing it. You could do a curves layer, and I just gave it a black mask, and I made it quite bright. It's a curves adjustment layer, and I'll hit B to bring out a brush, and it's a white feathered brush. And what I can do now is just brush in the curves layer if I want to sort of just shoot the sides here into pure white. But the problem is as you approach the reflection, it'll begin to become frayed, which is kind of reminiscent of a low production value in my mind. So while that is an option, we're not actually going to employ that today because I think it's a little too sloppy for the community here at Workflow. So what I'm going to do is make a new layer and bear with me here because it'll look confusing at first, but I'm going to paste white into that layer. Then I'm going to control G to group it. I'm going to give it a layer mask. And I'll invert that layer mask to be black. So we have a pure white layer, but we're omitting it from showing up with that black layer mask. And what I'll do from here is just make a very crude selection around my product where maybe it's not in pure white. And I'm doing this with the polygonal lasso tool. And before someone comments, I know this is going to be egregiously crude, this selection. But you could do this with the pen tool and make a nice selection. But I have to say it's actually quite lenient because we're masking something that's already on very light gray and we're masking it into being on white. So if the mask you know, is needing to be feathered or it's slightly off or crude, it's actually not that big of a deal because it's such a subtle transition from gray to white. Let's close this up here. Hey guys, I'm always interested in hearing how you found out about workflow. So why don't you take a moment and leave me a comment where you heard of us from. It always interests me very much. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Okay, so I just made a really crude selection around where that may not be completely white. And sorry, I'm going, kind of going all crazy now, but I completed that selection. <laughs> Whoa, that was crazy. And what I'll do is I'll paste white, not onto this layer because it's already white, but into the mask telling the grouping, hey, let the white pixels show up in those areas. And that's a really awesome solution. Now it'll look confusing up here 
but this doesn't matter because it's already on pure white. But what it did down here, which is awesome, is it created not only a mask where we cut that out from light gray to white, but now we can click on our mask and increase the feather. And by increasing the feather, you know, we can just make it so much more subtle or so much more, you know, straight edge. And I really like having the power. So we're not doing that, you know, on the fly. Everything's sort of quote unquote smart. We can adjust it later. And that's pleasant. So I'll feather that by maybe two pixels. And you know, I'm really proud that we got the actual item itself on white because I don't care if the reflection is, you know, 98% there in terms of quality. It's really the product that is the main focus and is the trickiest thing to recover if you don't get that on perfect white. But we did, we got it on perfect white. So let's add to this selection and make a really crude polygonal lasso around our, two, around our whole product. And we're already confident that everything here is now surrounded in white, which is why we can make a crude selection at this point. And I'll control shift I to invert that selection and I'll paste white into that mask again. Awesome, so now you have this grouped layer that's editable, but it's completely ensuring everything's clipped into white. And that's really beautiful because now we can look at this and sort of take it more seriously because we're seeing it in the natural canvas in which it will actually exist. You can kind of see the uh, Amazon ad building around it, I think. So what can we do next? Why don't we just start bringing in some of these elements? So here's our text layer. And boy, what a stark difference. Let's put this on light mode. And right away, you'll see the light switch element I was talking about. But we don't want all this jazz showing up down here. We don't want all this stuff showing up down here. So we'll give this another mask, invert it. And let me zoom in here for a quick moment. And I will paint in pretty simple, simple mask, just like that. How beautiful is that, eh? Beautiful, it's like butter. So there's the light switch, okay? And now the console, right, that's looking pretty dark and underwhelming there. And as we said, we can see the shadow from the handle here, so it's something we want to improve anyway. So here's the console shot. Again, let's give it a black mask. It's a recurring theme here in this workflow. Hit G to bring up our gradient. We'll do a radial gradient here. And why don't I do something like that? And why didn't that just work? Hmm, oh, I know why. We actually just pasted that onto our console. And we don't want to do that, I'll tell you that, so. Control Z that, click your mask first, and then we'll paste our gradient. Awesome, now do what we should have did first. We should have made sure it was lined up. Does that sound like a good idea? Let's, let's disable this mask for a moment and put this on difference mode. And let me show you the intrinsic value in difference mode, because now I can zoom in, and I can see using these letters where things really aren't lining up. And I'll click view and make sure snap is off, which it is. So I can really get on a pixel by pixel level and make sure that that's lined up nicely. And I certainly enjoy that because now we won't get any ghosting effects. So let's hit G to bring out that gradient again and third time's a charm. Give that a nice mask. Beautiful. And now you can toy around with different masks and see what's going to look the best. That's pretty nice. I got to say I don't enjoy some elements of how that was introduced. So why don't I hit L and I'll go in this dark section where I don't really think it was affecting it much anyway. And I'll make another crude selection around there. Lovely. And just all out here. And I'll just mask really crudely again those elements. And I'll bring black as my foreground color and hit Alt Delete to paste black in the mask just to get rid of that. And that's quite simple. So now we're not getting any negative aspects of that. But you see, like, what's that? Hmm, so weird. Random things show up when you do masking. So. You know, let's have that black brush handy and just mask it out anywhere it's not needed. I only intended it to be on, you know, the base part of this console. So that's looking pretty nice. Now look at the difference if I put this on lighten mode for a moment. It's pretty interesting. See, what lighten mode does is only allows it to lighten the underlying pixels, which can be useful, so it's not going to accidentally darken anything. But when you do put it on lighten, things to look out for are, look it up here as I put it on lighten mode, you'll see some ghosting artifacts get introduced, so stay wary of that. I'll just paint black and mask it away from there. And the reason that's happening is because we turned this handle away when we lit this, so you know the lightning is happening because the handle's not there, so it's kind of ghosting through. But I masked that all out. Beautiful. This is actually starting to look pretty good, I'm not going to lie. 
how about we do a hue saturation? And what we can do is just completely desaturate the whole image. And do you see a big difference? You barely do, right? But there was probably some level of blue cast in those reflections if you were to fully saturate it. Yeah, there's some blue in there. So by desaturating everything, you kind of get rid of that. But now the coffee had saturation in it. So again, I'm going to get a black brush out and I'm just going to omit that effect from taking place where the coffee was just in case any, you know, brown sort of amber hues want to shine through there. It was quite a black cup of coffee, I will say. So what can I do from here? Let's take a little looky-loo at the image here. Nice. She's looking a little dusty. So that's something we always have to address. So why don't we do that right off the bat by duplicating our base frame, just so we can keep everything, you know, salvageable. And I usually call that like cleaning frame. And even if you shot this perfectly in camera, you're still going to do some level of digital recleaning for sure. And you know, I'm glad I brought out the dust blower and salvaged some of that in camera because that might be the difference between taking a moment in post-production and taking an hour in post-production. So if you haven't realized by now, I hit J to bring up my patch tool and I'm just drawing circles around the dust and I'm just replacing them to other areas, resampling from areas that are not dusty. Okay. Pretty lengthy process, I gotta say. It's looking good. Uh, that's not dust, but it's kind of weird, so get rid of that. Um, there's a bit of a weird deal going on here. Like we see a highlight, it actually looks kind of pleasant, but it's not symmetrical, so I think I'm gonna actually get rid of it. I'll start with this odd shape. And see, so you can resample all around, but what you're obviously going to want to do is sort of line up things that are already happening, like that line, and it'll become a bit more manageable. Now I can grab that as a whole unit and resample from somewhere above. Beautiful. And it really is beautiful, I gotta say. Okay, now the specular highlights in here look kind of smudged slash smeared. We could apply Gaussian blur effects, we could apply you know, frequency separation if you want to get deep, but I'm just going to leave that like that for now. And let's take another look at the image and see what we can address next. Okay, well the text being not centered is pretty glaring of an issue, and I cognizantly made it like this because I was battling with the strip box widths and you know so many issues that I kind of settled on okay do you know, we can we can fix that in post production as long as everything else looks good and that's a pretty simple fix uh, it may depend on your screen and your display but do you see some nervous lines some sort of highlights actually going on here why don't I recreate that whole area first just kind of make it look more pure and perfect and that's kind of like 60 second fix I would do just to make the image kind of look more perfect so how can we do that well I'm going to turn off this text layer for a moment and what I'm going to do is on the cleaning frame, I'm actually going to get rid of the word, the title here. And let's do this. And I'm going to make a really fine selection. I'm a little shaky because I drank some of that coffee. Okay, nice. So we actually totally got rid of the text. So we're living in a magic world. And how about we actually just like paste dark information in here? That'd probably be the easiest way to do this. I'll make a new layer. We'll get out a black brush and we can just brush in you know, darkness up in here, and that's fine. It's kind of a nice solution. Great, and do you know where I also wanted to do that? I kind of wanted to do that here because it looked kind of nervous as well. I'll make a new layer, and I'll click once, hold shift, and click down, and that just did a straight black line, and that's really groovy, but I'll put that at like 50% opacity, actually maybe 80, just so some information can go through, we're not necessarily clipping to pure black. Awesome, but now that we have a bit of a blank canvas, I can bring this text information back and I can straighten it at my will. So I'll kind of sort of just move it over like that. And that's lovely. And are we sort of not masking that fully? Yeah, we're not. There we go. Awesome, and that can be rotated. Does it need to be rotated? Now when you go to rotate something and it gives you the whole boundary as the selection, let me show you a little trick you can do to be more precise. You can make selections around things like text, like that. 
and then you can give it a layer mask. And we already have a layer mask actually. So why don't I apply the layer mask, make a selection, give it a layer mask, and then apply the layer mask again. And what applying that layer mask did with that selection is just confined the whole element of that layer to that size. So now when we rotate it, we're not dealing with a huge crop box. You know, we're confined to these parameters. Does that need to be rotated? Honestly, that's when I'd probably want to bring out a ruler and, you know, do some work. And well, I have some pretty intricate ruler work going on there already, as you can see. So I'll hit Control H to hide that. Um, I can't even tell if that's crooked or not at this point, but that's something you'd take your time to address properly. Now, shooting in a small studio space is pretty challenging because so much ambient light bounces around the room. You have to deal with these areas, these four stop shadows. They aren't completely dark. You see sort of like lines and these are direct reflections. And that is, you know, one of the side effects of shooting in a small space. It's really hard to cut down on that light spill. That actually doesn't bother me. It accurately represents how the chrome looks and that's important as well. And I think aesthetically it actually looks kind of pleasing. So some more tricky areas to retouch that maybe I could touch on are certain things like down here, like what's that reflection? Well, who knows really, it could have been anything, but how can we fix that to make it perfect? What I think I'll do is get a marquee selection and I'll feather it by like four pixels and I'll just grab something from here and I'll hit Control J to duplicate that. So now we just have that on its own layer, which is important. And what I can do is move that over that layer and I'll just move it over to where it's lining up with everything. And that's nice. And then what I can do is I'll give it a mask, invert the mask, which we're all used to by now. And I'll draw a little lasso really crudely here just to say, hey, I don't want you to show up there. And I'll paste white into that mask part. So now we have that showing up and that's a solution. And it doesn't line up completely. So what I could do is go to curves, hit alt to attach that to the layer below it. And you know, I could kind of try to match it. So that, pardon me, these on and off. That's a pretty quick fix. That's a bit of a trickier fix though. So I thought I'd show you it before I just move on to the final product. In fact, something I've been neglecting because it's a bit trickier is this. So look at that. How could we retouch that? We could clone stamp. We could do a whole you know, series of fixes trying to approach that. But I think the easiest way to fix that may just be actually duplicate what's over here. So let's try doing that. Let's again do a really similar fix. I'm gonna get a feathered, actually I'm gonna feather this quite more, I'll do 20 pixels. I'm just guessing though, so I may have to redo it on the fly. Make a selection, hit Control J, hit Control T, right click, flip horizontal, beautiful. Let's move it over here. And now what I'm gonna to try to do is just line it up as much as possible. And then we'll mask it in selectively. So why don't I lower the opacity just so we can sign to see both of the layers. Okay, so where are we? Let's line up really solid things like where that meets that is good. Oh, but then that meets over there. You know, I think this is more important because here's where the problem is. So let's make sure this part is lined up pretty solidly. That looks quite well. Let's put that to 100% opacity. We'll give that a layer mask. We'll invert that and we will mask that in with white and we'll mask that in just in this area over here. And wow, that was a pretty quick solution. Now I got a little sloppy here with the mask, so let me paint some blackness down in there. Nice, and maybe that's not perfect. It could probably take a more you know, dedicated retouching attempt, but that's a quick solution. Sometimes if things are being stubborn and tricky, instead of clone stamping five million times, look on your product and say, is there another area I can sort of duplicate or recreate that from? Because it may be a lot easier. Okay, so we're approaching the end of this tutorial. I hope you all have enjoyed it so far. There's a few other tricks though I'm gonna share with you before we leave. Often people want their work in a perimeter of 255 catalog white. So let's bring in white as our foreground color and do one more gradient and I'll click at the bottom. I'll hold shift, let go of the top and that's a radial gradient. So let's do a linear and there you go. And that just ensures that you're on a perimeter of 255 white. Now this looks really nervous how close this is to the top of the frame, but of course you can hit C and you can expand your boundaries as much as you want, increasing the resolution. Because you know when you're on pure white, you're on pure white. You don't have to worry about you know background problems. 
I mentioned earlier that we did not put a light up here at the top of our coffee machine. And did I mention this earlier? I'm not sure, but I mentioned that we might actually be able to use the reflection frame to sort of fake um, a gradient happening at the top. Let me show you what I mean. I duplicated the reflection frame. I'm gonna bring it up here, delete the layer mask. And what I'm gonna do is something quite unique. I'm gonna make an elliptical marquee and I'm gonna mask it to this area only. All right, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna blend it in ever so slightly. And you see what that's doing? It's almost like turning a light on. And the reason that is the way it is is because the top layer is completely white and the reflection copy is completely black. So by controlling the mix between the two of them, I'm pretty much deciding what shade of gray I'm gonna allow that to be. So I'm gonna give that a layer mask and instead I'm gonna do a radial gradient. So I'll make it black and I'll move up here. What I'm gonna do is hit G, bring in my gradient, get a radial. And by doing a radial gradient and putting this fill very low, I can begin just to pepper that layer to be able to show up. And look at that, it's like I'm controlling how I light it. Like I can light it from here, I can do another one over here. If I want like a bilineal light, I can do a more radial gradient from the middle and that is completely at my fingertips in terms of how bright or how dark that is. And that's just one of the benefits of compositing. So I've said it before, but compositing isn't just a sneaky frugal workaround. It is beautiful to have the level of control you can have in post-production just by making a few dedicated steps to achieve that. Some people will say this took a little too long in post-production. And while that's true, I'm kind of stumbling here, crudely showing you how to do it. Once you develop your own processes and workflows, this stuff takes a matter of moments. I put this together and I really think this is a beautiful, strong recreation to throw together in a few minutes in Photoshop. Sure, it's not like melt your face off intensely gorgeous work, but I think it's a respectable e-commerce piece that we threw together with really simple stuff that you can purchase off Amazon. So all the equipment I used here today is linked in the description. I encourage you to check it out and make sure to ask me if you have any problems. I love helping people and I love helping people out in our Facebook group. So that link will be in the pinned comment if you're interested in learning Speedlight product photography right in your Facebook feed. Why not spice up your feed a bit? My name is Dustin Dolby. I hope you have a beautiful day. I'll see you here next time on Workflow. Take care, everybody.